the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you look at the small print on the bottom of the page of the hymn that we just sang, you'll notice that the words were written by James P. Tiefel, born 1949. I know it's probably a little tacky to say that, but I'm telling you that because I want you to know why I decided to write this hymn way back when. I was in one of my first years as a pastor back in Saginaw, and I was scheduled for the first time in my career to preach on the gospel of the baptism of Jesus. I got started working on my sermon, and all of a sudden it was Thursday, and I needed to choose some hymns. So I started looking through the pages of the old Lutheran hymnal, and I looked, and I looked, and I found one. Not one hymn, one line in one hymn. So there were no great delusions of being a poet and no visions of heaven, but necessity is the mother of invention. I needed a hymn for Sunday. This was the problem. For a long, long time, Christian preachers hardly ever preached about the baptism of Jesus. And that's why hymn writers never wrote hymns about the baptism of Jesus. Anybody who read his Bible knew the story was there, and children learned about the baptism of Jesus in Sunday school and in Bible history class, but, but we never heard about this event in Jesus' life in church. It was kind of like a, a beautiful gem that nobody ever got to see. All of that changed in the mid-1970s when a new church calendar replaced the old traditional calendar. And now you and I hear about the baptism of Jesus every single year on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. And the poets got busy and it's not hard to find good hymns about Jesus' baptism anymore. But I wonder if there isn't still a problem here. It's easy to miss this story. Matthew tells the whole story of Jesus' baptism in just five verses. And, and Mark, the gospel writer we heard today, and Luke use only two verses to tell the story. There's just not a whole lot of detail here. And when you stop to compare what, what happened at the Jordan River, it doesn't seem to be nearly as important as what happened at Bethlehem or, or Nazareth or Jerusalem. And finally, we're pretty familiar with baptisms. Especially here at Grace, we see baptisms all the time. So when you consider all of the great events in Jesus' life, and even the events in our life, it's probably not surprising that it's easy to miss the baptism of Jesus. Even today, as Pastor Bondo announced that the gospel is about the baptism of Jesus, did you notice that Mark begins by telling us about John the Baptist? We don't get to Jesus' baptism until the very end. Most of us are used to hearing about John the Baptist before Christmas. And so we have to get our timeline straightened out. I think some of you know that John the Baptist and Jesus were second cousins. Huh? And John was born six months before Jesus was born. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, John the Baptist was still just a little baby. John the Baptist showed up on the stage of Israel about 29 years later. And when he did, the people treated him almost as though he were a rock star. They flocked to meet him and to hear him preach. Mark tells us, 
the whole Judean countryside, and all the people of Jerusalem went out to see him. I suppose that John the Baptist was just weird enough to attract curiosity. Mark said he wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. But his message obviously struck a chord in a lot of people's lives. They, they got the impression that something important was about to happen, and they wanted their lives to change. And, and so Mark tells us, confessing their sins, they were baptized by John in the Jordan River. But even with his almost rock star reputation, John the Baptist always knew that he was not on center stage. John's entire ministry, all of his sermons, and all of his baptisms were all focused on the one who was to come. John knew that he had star appeal. John understood that the people wanted to follow him and, and listen to him. He realized that they wanted to change their lives, but John's whole focus was always on his cousin Jesus. John intended to say, repent of your sins, because Jesus is coming. Don't miss this. He said, after me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So one day, John was preaching and baptizing who knows how many hundreds of people. When all of a sudden, he looked up and he spied someone walking toward the Jordan River. Someone about his age. Someone he knew. The Bible writers lead us to believe that Jesus almost certainly came to the Jordan River alone. St. Matthew tells us about a short conversation that occurred between John and Jesus, but neither Luke nor Mark mention it. It's altogether likely that Jesus stood there and listened to John preach, and then at the appointed time, he stood in line and he waited for his turn to walk into the Jordan River and to be baptized by John. Nobody noticed anything special. Just about everybody missed it. But God the Father didn't miss it, and neither did God the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Mark says. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, that's kind of impressive. What was going on here? Well, when Jesus walked into the Jordan River, he was giving his indication that he was willing to take up the role that God had planned for him ever since Adam and Eve first fell into sin. Jesus was not walking into the Jordan River to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was no sinner. He may have been Mary's human son, but he was also God's divine son, and he didn't sin. He didn't need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus walked into the Jordan River, he walked into the river with sinners. I mean that literally, but I also mean that figuratively. Jesus took his place to be the Savior of every sinner who ever walked on the face of the earth. St. Paul was writing to the Christians in Corinth when he said, He who had no sin became sin for us, <clears throat> so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here at the Jordan River, Jesus accepted his role as the Savior of the world. He indicated that he was now willing to be whom God had called him to be and that he was ready to begin his ministry. And God the Father and God the Spirit 
responded to God the Son with power and with love and with joy and encouraged Jesus as he began his ministry to walk toward the cross. But guess what? Nobody saw it. And nobody heard it. Maybe John, but most Bible scholars are convinced that not even John heard the voice of God or saw the Spirit as a dove. Everybody missed this. What do you think would have happened if they hadn't missed it? What would have happened if they heard the voice of God and they saw the Spirit as a dove? I, I have to believe that everybody would have dropped to their knees and recognized that Jesus was the Son of God. Even the, even the skeptics from Jerusalem would have had to admit that Jesus was God. Everybody would have followed Jesus. Everybody would have believed in him. Nobody would ever have had the nerve to arrest him. And had the voice been heard and the dove been seen, Jesus could have avoided the cross and never died. Oh, maybe not so good. That no one heard the voice of God and no one saw the descent of the Spirit was part of God's plan as he sent his Savior to be the Savior of all. Well, here's another God's part of God's plan. It is part of God's plan that you and I do not miss this. We can't miss this. We really can't. And yet the story of Jesus is sometimes easy to overlook. There are lots of sensational prophets in our world, just as there were sensational prophets then. There are other prophets like John the Baptizer who may not wear funny clothes or eat funny food but are just as sensational as John was and often attract our attention just like John attracted the attention of the people of Israel. They will dangle in front of us the promise that if we follow Jesus our lives will have success and our bank accounts will be filled. They will manipulate our emotions and lead us to look inside of ourselves to make some sort of decision for Christ. They will plead with us to see Jesus as the savior of social oppression and problems. And they will debate with us that Jesus will accept everyone no matter what their lifestyle or their personal belief. They will argue with us that, after all, we can't really know what Jesus was like at all. We can't even be sure if he existed. They won't wear clothes like the Baptist or eat grasshoppers, but they will be appealing and attractive and compelling. They can be just as sensational as the voice in the wilderness, except they will never do what John did. They will never point us to the Christ of the scriptures. And because of them, sometimes Jesus is easy to miss. We haven't seen the heavens torn open or the voice or the, the spirit descending as a dove. We haven't heard the voice of God thundering in the skies. We hear the words of the Bible. We see the water of baptism. We taste the bread and the wine in Holy Communion. But sometimes we miss the power in our lives. We believe in Jesus, but sometimes we wonder. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we commit really horrible sins. And sometimes we bear a whole lot of guilt on our shoulders and sometimes we wonder have I missed something? Well, 
Maybe I have. Brothers and sisters, don't, don't miss this. Don't miss what John the baptizer is telling you today. That there is no other person in the history or on the face of this planet who is as important for you as Jesus the Christ. Don't miss the reality that neither you nor I nor John are worthy to even stoop down and tie his shoestrings. Don't listen, don't miss what he tells you. That Jesus sends the Holy Spirit into our lives to create a faith attachment with Jesus. To cover us with the perfect blood and righteousness of the Savior. And to join us to the family of God. You and I were not there to see the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. But don't miss the reality that when Jesus walked into that river, he was determined to walk with our walk so that he could carry our sins to the cross. We did not hear the voice of God, nor see the heavens rend or the Spirit descend as a dove. But don't miss the reality what John, what Mark has told us in the gospel for this day, that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, that he is in fact the one whom God chose to be the Savior of the world, and he does come to us in his word and in his sacraments. We may not have seen all of the great miracles of the scriptures, and yet Jesus has redeemed you a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won you from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil. He forgives you every day. He is with you wherever you go. And he promises that you will be with him in heaven. It's all right here in the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. Don't miss this. A little story with an enormous impact for you and me. Hear it. Believe it. Live it. Sing it. Amen. Please stand.